Well, hello, First Baptist. This is your pastor, and this is your midweek update. I hope this video finds you doing great, and I'm excited about studying God's Word with you. Uh, before we do that, just a reminder, uh, in, in an ongoing manner, we are still taking precautions with all the COVID-19 uh, things that are going on. And, and uh, right now, because of all of that, the only on-campus gatherings we have are uh, 9 o'clock Sunday morning, uh, 10.30 Sunday morning. Both of those are worship services. We keep people socially distanced. We're asking you to wear a mask. Uh, we're trying to clean before and after and between the services. And so we're doing everything we can to, to keep you safe and to take wise precautions. But we do have on-campus worship at 9 o'clock and 10.30. If you're not comfortable getting out yet, and I know many are not, and many, frankly, should not get out right now because of health vulnerabilities, we have a live stream option for you. We are currently upgrading our live stream uh, equipment and software. And so hopefully uh, by this Sunday, you will see a marked improvement with our live stream uh, video. But that will be at 1030. And so if you want to just tune in and worship with us at 1030, that will be an, an opportunity for you. In, in terms of the future, in terms of other ministries and programs in the life of our church, we, as a staff, have been working on a plan. We have a phase-in uh, plan, a phase-in scenario. We have uh, some dates we've looked at and, and some, some um, processes for that. But we're just waiting to see. You know, there's been an uptick in the numbers, and so we're just waiting to see how things do and waiting to see uh, how it continues to affect our community so that we can make good decisions and wise decisions. So keep praying. Pray that uh, the Lord would take this pandemic away. Pray that God would use this in your life and in my life and in our church and in our community and our nation uh, that uh, the Lord might get our attention through all of this and show us our frailty, show us our need for Him that, that many, uh, thousands upon thousands, might turn to uh, the Lord. Again, so glad you're tuning in because we are studying the Sermon on the Mount, not the entire sermon, we're looking at the beginning of the sermon the intro, most commonly referred to as the Beatitudes. This is a sermon that Jesus preached. It's found in Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. At the very beginning of this sermon, we see these Beatitudes, which are keys to a blessed life. And, and really, they're more than that. These Beatitudes are characteristics of kingdom citizens. The Sermon on the Mount is a sermon about how kingdom citizens, citizens of the kingdom of God, ought to live their life and the difference we ought to make. And, and these Beatitudes really, really get the ball rolling as Jesus helps us to understand what it looks like to live out uh, kingdom characteristics that point people to Jesus and make a difference in this world. And so we've been walking through them and we've come to our last uh, couple of Beatitudes. They, they really go together, so I'm going to take the last two um, together, but we'll begin in verse one, uh, or I'm sorry, verse three, uh, Matthew chapter five, verse three, where Jesus says, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy." Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And 10 through 12 is the section we want to focus on this today where it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. On April 18th, 2007, in Malatya, Turkey, three Christians, Nakata Aden, Igor Yüksel, Tilman Geski, were murdered by five young Muslim Turks. And these three Christians worked in a Christian publishing office, office and according to a newspaper, uh, one of the suspects declared to the police while being questioned, We didn't do this for ourselves. We did it for our religion. May this be a lesson to the enemies of our religion. 
And so back in 2007, we see this, this really tragic example of three young men being killed simply because they represented Jesus Christ. And, and they were murdered. They were martyred for their faith in Christ. And, and persecution is ongoing. There are some horrid things happening right now in Nigeria, ongoing persecution in China and other places in the world. And so persecution is a reality. It's, it's all around us. And Jesus wants us to understand as kingdom citizens, here's how we are to think of persecution and, and walk through uh, persecution. So just uh, three things I want you to see from this text. First of all, I want you to think about the reality of persecution. The, the reality of persecution. He says there in verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Persecution is presented in the Bible not as a possibility or even a probability. Persecution is, um, is highlighted in the Bible as a promise. It is a promise for those that follow Christ. The word persecuted is dioko. It means to pursue with a view to apprehension and persecution. And this word here is a, is a perfect participle. This, this indicates the, the present reality of the situation. So Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are persecuted in an ongoing way for their faith. And so here's what this, this means. If a Christian is truly following God, they will always walk in the shadow of impending abuse from the enemies of Christ. It's, it's going to happen. It's a promise from Scripture. Uh, over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, listen, will be persecuted. That's not a possibility or a probability. That is a promise. Now, what's the cause uh, of persecution? Why are Christians actually persecuted for their faith? Uh, well, first of all, is nonconformity. He says there in verse um, verse ten, "Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake." So they're persecuted for the way that they live. They're persecuted for living a righteous life, a life that reflects godliness and holiness and Christ likeness and a biblical ethic. And and someone that lives that kind of life, he says, will be persecuted. People possessing the quality of righteousness will naturally stand out in the crowd and, and they will not be understood by others. And so back in 2 Timothy where uh, the, Lord, the, the Bible says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Listen to the, the characteristics of those who can uh, claim this promise. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance. So Paul's talking to those who are following in his footsteps, living a righteous life. And, and Paul's saying, if you live a righteous life, if you live a godly life, if you do the right thing, if you live under the banner of the name of Jesus, it's a promise you will be persecuted. So the first reason that we are persecuted is just nonconformity to the ways of this world. And people don't like nonconformity. Ralph Waldo Emerson famously said, for nonconformity, the world whips you with its displeasure. But there's a second reason, a second cause for persecution. That is who we represent. Look what Jesus says there in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. And listen to this next phrase. On my account. Jesus is saying the reason they are heaping uh, uh, persecution on you and uttering falsehoods about you is, is because of me. It's on my account. It's because of who we represent. Over in John 15, Jesus makes this clear. He said, they persecuted me and you are my friends. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute my friends, those who uh, live under the, the, the banner of my name. Now, there are places in the world where it's unsafe for Americans uh, to go. Not because they've done anything, but simply because of who they represent. There, there are some places that you go, if people know that you are an American, you are in inherent danger because you are a, a citizen of the United States. And, and that's close to what Jesus is saying here. Uh, there are times you'll be persecuted, not because of what you do, 
but simply because of who you represent. People know that you are a follower of Christ, and the enemies of the cross don't like that, and they will revile you and say false things about you and come against you in persecution. And so uh, we are persecuted because of nonconformity and because of who we represent. Now, this leads to the question, uh, Pastor Wade, I, I don't experience this kind of stuff. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I've never experienced what the, the young men in Turkey experienced or the, the underground church in China experienced. Why don't, I, why don't we in America experience more um, in-your-face persecution? Well, James Montgomery Boyce says this, Much of our Christianity has sunk to the level where it is hardly noticed. There is sometimes precious little true Christian character. So remember, Jesus is talking about those who, who boldly, publicly live uh, for Him, for His name, for His sake, those who are living righteous lives. And so if we're just kind of blending into the culture, blending into the crowd, if worldliness has crept in and, and it's hard to see the Jesus in us, then you know we, we should not expect much real persecution. But the moment we seek to really live boldly for Christ and we stand for what's right and stand against what's wrong and let the light of Jesus shine for us and, and point people to the cross and the empty tomb, when that begins to happen, Jesus tells us persecution will come. And, and we need to understand that, the reality of persecution. But we talked about the cause of persecution, but what are the characteristics? What, what does persecution uh, look like? Well, first of all, Insults and lies. Look in verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So insults, re reviling. We're seeing this in an increasing way in our nation as, as our growing secular culture is seeking to marginalize Christians. We, we see really just, just insults towards those who would dare to name the name of Christ and live for His glory and, and uh, just heaping up scorn um, against those who follow Christ. And then there's just flat out lies. Jesus said, you can expect people to, to speak falsely uh, about you on my account. And, and so those who boldly live for Christ can expect falsehood, uh, expect to be lied about and misrepresented. And, and Jesus said that will be the case. And so, first of all, the first characteristic of, of persecution is insults and lies. Um, and then look in verse 12, he says, Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Which leads to the question, how do they persecute the prophets? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, you see how they persecuted the prophets. Intimidation, 1 Kings chapter 19. Hatred, 1 Kings chapter 22. Physical harm, Jeremiah 26 and Daniel chapter 3 and 6. Ridicule, Amos chapter 7. And so we can expect to be treated like the Old Testament prophets. That, that's what persecution can look like, the different forms that persecution can take. Insults, lies, intimidation, hatred, physical harm, ridicule. That's what followers of Christ can expect, which leads to the second heading. We've talked about the reality of persecution, but how should we respond to persecution? What should our response be? This doesn't sound like much fun, does it? So, so how should Christians respond to persecution? Well, first of all, we should endure. We should endure. Now, this, this idea of enduring is implied in the text. He, he says there, Blessed are you, you when others revile you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So he's saying you're living for me. And the implication here is that you'll keep on living for me even though you are going through these difficulties. Uh, verse 10, blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness sake. The implication here is you'll keep living a righteous life even though you are being persecuted in an ongoing manner. So this speaks of, of endurance, enduring through tough times. In fact, right after this section called the Beatitudes, Jesus talks about some more, um, uh, more, some more about the lifestyle of a Christian in our culture. And he says there, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? You are no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
So this seems like Jesus is saying, if you're persecuted, don't stop living for me. In fact, if you're persecuted, let your, let your life be salty. Salt was a preservative in the first century. It still uses as a preservative today. And, and Christians are to live in such a way that we, we slow down the decay of our secular society. We are, we are preservative and we are light. We let our light shine uh, so that people can see the glory of God in our lives can move others closer to Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, even if you are being persecuted, lied about, physical harm, insults, whatever may come for following Christ, keep on being salt and keep on being light. Endure. So you need to understand that when you're going through difficulty for following Christ, Jesus is with you. He says over in the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So Jesus knew that as as his disciples went out and shared the gospel, and other folks were saved, and then they would baptize them and train them to live for Jesus, Jesus knew this would not be hard. I mean, this would not be easy. He knew it would be very hard. He knew that his disciples would would undergo great hardship for making disciples in in, in the Roman Empire in the first century. And so Jesus adds this little segment on the end. He says, For I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. We have that promise. Even when we are being persecuted for our faith, Jesus is with us and Jesus is watching over us um, when we suffer. So the first thing is endure. Don't throw in the towel. Keep on keeping on for Jesus. It may be hard, but it's worth it. Why is it worth it? Well, at least to the second response to persecution, not only endurance, but we ought to rejoice and be glad. Uh, there in verse uh, uh, 11, it says, uh, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Doesn't sound like much fun, but listen to verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. If you are being persecuted, Jesus said, you ought to, you ought to be joyful. You ought to be glad. You ought to be thankful and grateful that you are being persecuted. Now, why in the world would Jesus say that? In fact, he doesn't just say it, he commands it. This is an imperative here. He says, rejoice and be glad. Why should we be glad? Look at the next phrase. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is saying, you ought to rejoice. You ought to be glad when you're persecuted because uh, you will be rewarded in uh, heaven. Over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 14, uh, Peter writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled, listen, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. And so Peter here is saying, if you are being persecuted for following Christ, there's a special nearness from God that you experience. The the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And when we all get to heaven, there will be a reward for living faithfully, enduring suffering for the sake of Christ. So rejoice, be glad, because when you are persecuted, people are just adding to your reward for following Christ. But there's a third Um, a third heading here. We talked about the reality of persecution and the response to persecution, but third, just a word about the rewards of persecution. What do those rewards look like? Well, he says there uh, in verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ultimately, those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake go to heaven when they die. Uh, Here's what's being said here. You don't go to heaven because you're persecuted. You go to heaven because you're saved, because you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if, if someone who, who names the name of Christ never experiences any persecution at all, it may be fairly asked, are they displaying any righteousness? If there is no righteousness in their life, is there, if there's no conformity to God's will in their life, can they really say they're a Christian? Can they really say they're going to heaven when they die? In, in other words, those who are truly saved, those who are truly passionately following Christ, will exemplify righteousness and, and, and those folks who are truly saved will go to heaven when they die. And when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, and it will be worth it to have followed Christ even through great hardship. So the, the kingdom of heaven is, is, is our reward 
uh, as we deal with suffering. We know that we get to go to heaven when we die. And, and there are special rewards in heaven. Now remember my first um, illustration, opening illustration about the three young Christian men in a Christian publishing house who were martyred for being Christians? Uh, well, Malatya, Turkey is an interesting area of the world. It's the modern day city of Smyrna. And, and I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. I want you to see what the Lord says, what Jesus says to the church in Smyrna in the first century. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. To the angel or the pastor of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and last who died and came to life. Now listen to what Jesus says to this church. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. In other words, he's saying, you're about to be persecuted for following me. He says, behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful, endure unto death. And this is what he says, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here's what he's saying to the church in Smyrna. You're about to go through some great hardship. You're about to suffer for me, even die for me. But when you get to heaven, there will be a crown of life, a reward in heaven. It will be worth it to have lived for me, even through intense persecution. So it's interesting that, that this same area of the world where three young men were martyred in 2007 is, is the same area that Jesus addresses and says, Be faithful unto death. Follow me unto death, and there will be a great reward. And so back in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, we see that there are uh, there is a reality when it comes to persecution. There is a response we ought to have when it comes to persecution. And there are rewards we can expect when we walk through persecution. So Jesus could say, Blessed are those, blessed are those, happy, contented, joyful, blessed are those who exhibit this characteristic, living for righteousness, even righteousness that brings hardship and reviling and insults on account of me. Blessed are those because we understand the big picture. We understand that it's worth it to live for Jesus even when it's hard. So just practically uh, apply to your life. Think about your life. Think about uh, the way you live. Are you living a life that your light is shining? Are you being salt? Is there righteousness in your life that, that really goes against the grain of the secularism uh, and ungodliness in our culture? And, and if you are, are you prepared to endure even if people turn on you? If people say false things about you or insult you or marginalize you or ignore you or leave you out or whatever the case may be, are, are you willing to keep living for Jesus and for His glory? It may be that you experience some hardship even in your family or in your workplace or among friends or, or any area in our society. Because you live for Jesus, it may cause some hardship. It, it, and, 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 and it's difficult. But this, this passage reminds us, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Don't throw in the towel. Be faithful. It will be worth it when we all get to heaven. Now, as we close our time, I want to pray for us. I want to pray for you and pray that, that God would really uh, write this me message upon our hearts and encourage us with it and strengthen us with it. And uh, not just this, this, um, this beatitude, but all the beatitudes we've studied, that, that these beatitudes would really become growing characteristics in our lives. So let's, let's pray together today. Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. and We are grateful, Lord, for this day that you've given us. Every day is a gift from you, and you tell us to rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, I'm grateful for this study of the Beatitudes, Lord, what you've taught us, what you've reminded us of, what you've shown us. And God, I pray that, that you would, by your grace, allow us to exemplify these, these kingdom characteristics in an ever-increasing way in our lives. Uh, Lord, help us just to, to walk, walk out, live out these Beatitudes. And, and Lord, as we think about persecution and hardship for living a life of nonconformity, for living a life of righteousness, I pray you'd give us courage and strength to keep on keeping on, even when our stand for Jesus makes it hard. 
And we'll thank you, Lord, for that sustaining, equipping grace in our lives. Lord, I pray for my church family, those who are listening, those who, Lord, aren't able to tune in today or haven't tuned in today. God, I, I pray that you would just bless those in our church family with just continued peace and strength, even as we walk through a difficult time in our nation. God, I pray that our church family would experience your nearness and your provision for, uh, for our lives. And Lord, that we would, we would use this time, even though it's hard, we would use this time to draw closer to you, to fix our eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And Lord, as our nation walks through this and all that's going on, Lord, the, the unrest, the, the changes, the, the, the pandemic, all, all that's happening, God, uh, Lord, it's disconcerting. And, and, and Lord, I pray that you would use this, this discomfort that we feel with all that's going on to remind us of how much we need you. God, remind us as a nation of our frailty and our need to, to turn to you and fear you and follow you and live for you. And so, God, I do pray that you would use this, this pandemic, this hardship, this difficult year we're walking through, to, uh, to, to just work in people's hearts, Father, that, that there might be renewal, that there might be revival, that there might be awakening in our nation. And Lord, Lord let it begin with me. Let it begin with our church. Let it begin with our families, God. Uh, Lord, send a great revival through this, Lord, and do something um, just mighty and magnificent through it all. And we will thank you and praise you for that grace. God, we, we pray for those that are grieving in the life of our church. God, would you draw near to them with comfort and strength. Lord, those that are going through physical situations, God, we pray for healing, pray for wisdom for doctors, and God, we pray that those who are really struggling physically, that you would just raise them up with physical and emotional and spiritual strength and, and just watch over them and, and bring about healing, Lord, in, in their lives. And Lord, as we think about our nation, we do pray for our first responders. Uh, we pray for our military, God. Uh, we pray for those who are making decisions about... Um, things related to reopening and dealing with the pandemic and, and all of this, God. We pray for wisdom uh, with, with, for our leaders. And, and uh, God, we, we just pray that you would just continue to watch over us and, and do a work um, in our nation by your grace and for your glory. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross and for the empty tomb. And Lord, I pray you'd help us just to continue to fix our eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, thank you. Uh, again, I'm glad you're studying God's Word with me. And until we meet again, may the Lord richly bless you.